Pray with me, would you? Father, as we come this morning, we have a desire, Lord, to hear from you. And we have a desire, Lord, more than anything else, to glorify you, to lift your name up, and to see, Lord, your will not only accomplished in our church, but in our individual lives. We pray this morning, Lord, that uh, as we read your word and that as we study it, that you would speak through the instrument and power and presence and person of the Holy Spirit, and that he would draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay standing with me if you would and open your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Our text this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 8, the title of the message is Give Us a King. I begin in verse 1, and it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, we have, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint us a king for uh, us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they, have, they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but have rejected me from being king over them, like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, then listen to their voice, however, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked him uh, for a king. And he said, this, is, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen. And they will run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties. And some to do his plowing and some to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards for your olive and your olive groves and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will make you, take your male servants and your female servants and your very best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. God, may he add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. This can be described as one of the most important chapters in all of the Old Testament because here in this chapter we have a shift from a theocracy to a monarchy. Israel is moving from a place where God has been their king and he's used judges to speak to them and to judge them and lead them and now they have become so canonized they become so much like the Canaanites that surround them that they want to have a government, a governance like the nations around them. They want to be like Canaan. To understand the passage, like all other biblical texts, it's necessary to put it into context. It's not by accident that it comes after chapter 7. Even though many years have passed between the two chapters, while Samuel was clearly an adult in chapter 7, now the Scripture represents that Samuel is an older man. He's began to turn some of the responsibilities over to his sons. Up to this point, as we notice, they've not had a human king. Samuel's been faithful. Samuel's had a long and fruitful ministry in Israel. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They were not faithful to follow God. 
now ostensibly because he's old and his sons are corrupt. Israel doesn't want another prophet. Israel doesn't come and say, we want godly men serving over us. Israel doesn't say, listen, go to God on our behalf, Samuel, and tell God we want somebody who is like you, who will be faithful to hear the word of God and speak the word of God to us. No, no, no. They are not seeking God's counsel. They have made up their minds for themselves that they want to be like the nations around them. And so instead of going to God and asking for his counsel and seeking direction for his will, they go to God with what they want. Imagine that. We've never done that, have we? So they gather at Ramah and they tell tell Samuel, give us a king. And it's not that they didn't have a right to have a king. I mean, if you will read the Old Testament, you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And listen to what it says beginning in verse 14. God said, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it, and you will say, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as a king over yourselves. You will not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not, of your, who is not your brother. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly increase gold and silver for himself. Now, when it shall come about that he sits on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him that he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left, in order that he and his sons may continue continue long in the kingdom in the midst of Israel. So now in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, Moses is speaking prophetically. Moses is saying, when you get into the land, you're going to want a king. And here's the kind of king that God wants you to have. He wants you to have one that God chooses. He wants you to have one that loves the word of God and will lead the people to do the will of God. But that's not what Israel is saying. Israel isn't coming to Samuel and saying, listen, you know, back in Deuteronomy 17, they're, they're, they're ignoring everything. They're saying, we want to have a king like the Canaanites have a king. That's a very important distinction to make in this text. So Samuel does what every, every godly leader would do. He takes it personally. Notice that. It's like, what? I'm chopped liver? You tired of me? What, I haven't done a good job for you? You you just want to throw me out with the trash? Poor me. Samuel's having a pity party, and he invites God. And this is something to say. God's not interested in Samuel's pity party, and he's not interested in mine or yours. God basically tells Samuel, Samuel... Get over yourself. If you haven't noticed, it's not about you, it's about me. They haven't rejected you. You're just my spokesman. They've rejected me. He says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to them and tell them what's going to happen to them if they get a king, when they get a king. He's going to tax you. He's going to become better than all of you. He's going to make you his servants. I want you to warn them of the consequences of their actions. Isn't that just like God, to warn us of the consequences of sin? But do you think we listen? It didn't make any difference. They had their minds made up. We don't care what God has to say. We know what we want, and we're going to get it. And so Samuel goes back to the people and he says, listen, here's what's going to happen. If you get a king, he's going to take your daughters, he's going to take your sons, he's going to take the best of your flocks, he's going to take the best of your, 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 your crops, he's going to take everything. And they said, we don't care, we want a king. And isn't it interesting that as Samuel goes back and relates to God as if God needed to, to hear it from Samuel, God already knew what they said. 
But Samuel goes back and relates this. God, it's almost with a sense of incredulity. You know, I can't believe that after warning them, they still want a king. God says, go ahead and give them what they want. Sometimes, folks, God will give us what we want, not what we need, because we don't seek him first. And sometimes we suffer the consequences of, of getting what we want rather than what God wants. So now let's look at how we apply this to our lives. There are five, four or five things I want you to see. The first is this. There's a word here about the dangers of desiring to be like the nations around us. One of the most interesting things about this text is the word translated nations. It's found twice in the text, in the beginning of verse 5 and then in verse 20. And interestingly enough, it's often translated in other parts uh, of the Old Testament as Gentiles or heathens. In their demand for a king, listen to what they are literally saying. We want to be like the heathens around us. It could just as well have been translated that way. That's what the Hebrew text says. We want to be like everybody else. They no longer want to be a peculiar people. They no longer want to be set apart. They want to be <coughs> accepted in Canaan. Now you need to remember that all of this is being done within the context of a covenant relationship that God has with Israel. You and I are in covenant relationship with, with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the new covenant. They were under the, the old covenant, the Mosaic, the law. But they were under a covenant with God, covenant relationship. But what the text tells us is if we're not intentional about being God's people in a fallen world, that the fallen world around us will draw us to itself. Like, like metal filings to a magnet, we will want to be attached to the world because nobody wants to be on the outside. Nobody wants to be different. We all want to be accepted. This is, in fact, the history of the nation of Israel and all of God's people, for that matter, in verse 8. It's what God says his people have done since he delivered them from Egyptian captivity. They forsook him and worshipped other gods. They allowed idols in their lives, idols that replaced the one true God as the focus of their love and devotion, idols they worshipped whom they served, for whom they lived. But don't neglect the context. They became idolaters precisely because they wanted to be like the nations around them. They didn't stand up to the culture. They didn't confront the culture. They conformed to the culture. This is one of the most contemporary passages in all of the Old Testament, folks. If we've ever lived in a day when the church was becoming more like the world, it is today. The Scripture calls us to be set apart. It calls us to come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. But we don't want to be separate. We want to be like the world around us. We want to be secret agents for Jesus in hostile territory. But Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things we seek after will be added unto us. But what we've been taught and what we believe is that if we can just be just enough like the world, and we have all kinds of ways to, 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 to justify this, we say, well, you know, I can't, I, I can't win people to Jesus if, if I don't relate to them. So I'm going to become like them. Paul says to become all things to all men, so it might save some. So I'll just be a little bit more like the world. I'll look a little bit more like the world. I'll act a little bit more like the world. I'll talk a little bit more like the world. I'll fit in with the flow of the world, and then people will come to me, and I'll tell them about Jesus. But when you do that, there's nothing different about you than the world so what do they want you've got nothing to give them if you have bought into their value system if you bought into what they think is important then you've got nothing to give them that they don't already have better than you you see to a large degree it's our uniqueness our separation from the world unto God that makes us his people that's what the word holy means it means to be set apart 
It means to be separate. But when we become so much like the pagans we're supposed to reach with the gospel that there's no visible, distinguishable difference between our lives and theirs, then the transforming power of the gospel cannot clearly be seen and they won't understand the necessity of the gospel in their life. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not calling you to be weird for Jesus. You ever know somebody who's weird for Jesus? I know people that are weird for Jesus. A little bit touched. They look weird. They act weird. Nobody wants to be like that. I, you know, I'm not telling you you have to be weird for Jesus or creepy for Jesus or, 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 or be some kind of weirdo, you know. What I am saying is that there ought to be a marked difference between our lives and the lives of the world. So much so that they notice it. So much so that when we love people, we genuinely love them. So much so that when we forgive, we genuinely forgive. So much so that when we have possessions and property, we recognize that it really belongs to God and we treat it that way. In every area of our life, we ought to recognize that Jesus Christ is King. And the world ought to see that in us. That's why it's scr Scripture says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Our entire outlook on life ought to be different than the rest of the world. In our personal lives, in our business lives, in our hobbies, in our service to the local church, it ought to be ever evident to everybody that Jesus is in charge. The problem, of course, is that every week it seems like somebody has given in to culture. I don't know. I got off of Twitter. It's just good for my spiritual life to get off Twitter. I, I don't have a Facebook account. Thank God. Got rid of that thing. It, it, it never encouraged me spiritually. Listen, a, a picture of a cat hanging on to a wire doesn't encourage me spiritually. Or a picture of what you're having for dinner doesn't encourage me spiritually. But you know, social media just works in a very negative way because we're looking enviously at what other people have or what others are doing, or people get on there and they argue back and forth. There's nothing good on it. But I, I, I got off of there. But when I was on there, it was like almost every month somebody was coming out, some megachurch pastor was renouncing the faith or was giving in to one of the moral situations in our culture, giving in to LGBTQ, giving in to abortion, abandoning the authority of the word. It seems like every week somebody was giving up, somebody had fallen, somebody had abandoned the faith. That's what's going on in our world. And folks, listen to me. I am going to tell you, if Kirby Woods Baptist Church is going to be what God wants Kirby Woods Baptist Church to be, it's going to be because you are different than the world around you. That is what God will use to draw people in. That is what God will use. He wants to make you something that no other church in this area is. Something unique, something special, something that is set aside for him. Our text serves as a warning that we should not lust after the culture. In our quest to become more relevant to the pagans around us, I'm concerned that perhaps we've not only become irrelevant to the culture, we've become irrelevant in the kingdom of God. Jesus says that if the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be cast out. There ought to be a difference. May God grant us the courage to be in the world and not of it, to be recognizable as his people in a world that rejects him and relational enough to bring those people to know him. This is the second thing I want you to see. And that's about God's glory versus individual insult. When the Israelites come to Samuel, perhaps, I mean, I don't know. I can tell you as a pastor that when you represent God, sometimes you take things personally, but you shouldn't. You can't. You have to remember, just like I have to remember, that it's never about us. 
It's always about God. You see, instead of being incensed and having righteous indignation for God's glory, Samuel is taking it personally. Oh, they don't like me. <laughs> Grow up, Samuel. Grow up. Your job, Samuel, is not to be liked. Your job is not to perpetuate your job. Your job is just to be a faithful spokesman. Who they've rejected, God says, is me. What we can take away from this is that we need to be sure that we see things for what they really are, that we're looking at things from God's perspective and not merely from a human or selfish perspective. We need to be careful not to take every insult, every disrespectful word spoken against us or unjust action taken against us personally. Sometimes, you see, the reason it feels personal is that we tend to forget it's not about us. I know many pastors who've been put through the ringer by churches, and some of them deserved it. Some of them were just numbskulls. They made bad decisions, and they suffered the consequences of their decisions. Don't mistake me. Listen, sometimes we suffer because we do dumb things. But I know pastors who have suffered because they did what God told them to do. I have a good friend who's on a who's an evangelism director for one of the southern state conventions. And uh, we went to seminary together. We've known each other a long time. And he was pastoring a church one time. And, man, it was in a smaller town in Texas. And he began to, I mean, the church just began to grow. People were getting saved. Baptism waters were stirring. The church was taking on a brand new life. Sunday morning service was so exciting, so vibrant, they didn't have any room. And he went to the deacons and he said, deacons, listen, God is growing our church. Isn't this awesome? We need to build a new sanctuary. And here's exactly what they said. We don't need a new sanctuary. We need a new pastor. We've got more people than we need. And they fired him because they were losing control of the church. And they didn't want all those new people coming in and messing up their religious stamped social club. <laughs> I have a friend, we were driving past a church one time that was, uh, well, it was, see, 80% of Southern Baptist churches are, in, are stagnant or in decline. 80% of our Southern Baptist churches are stagnant or in decline. And we were driving past one of those churches one time, and we were, I was asking him about it. He said, Calvin, God doesn't own nearly as much property as we thought he did. You see, what we need to remember is it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about God, and it's about God's glory. And that's one of the lessons that God is teaching Samuel. Samuel, it's not about you, it's about me. He took it personally, but God told him, you need to look at things from a spiritual point of view. There's a third thing, and there's a word here about who's king in our life. As we've mentioned, the people had not rejected Samuel. They've rejected God. They wanted control of their own destiny. They wanted a king they thought would be able to do what they wanted him to do. Here's the thing. Can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I tell you something? And my wife told me to stop saying, can I tell you something? So i got to stop that. <laughs> She's listening. And so just... Here's the thing. God doesn't need our input. And we cannot manipulate God. Why do you think they wanted a king? They wanted a king because they could control that king. They could manipulate that king. They could politic with that king, or at least they thought they could. They will find out the hard way that they could not. They will find out that you can go against God's word all you want, but it's always going to be true. They would find out that what they wanted was not what God wanted, and that's called sin. And the consequences of their sin were certain. They would find out. They would find out that having someone that they could control 
was not really what they wanted. How often is it that we think what we want is what we want until we get what we think we want and then we think, this is not what I want? Come on now. What's interesting to me in all of this is they're not, they're not thinking about God's will at all. They're just saying, we want to be like the heathens around us. We want a king like they have. They stopped seeing themselves as a unique, special people, and they began saying, we would rather be like the Canaanites than be set apart for God. How do, how do we get to that point, folks? It's the frog in the kettle, isn't it? You just turn it up one degree at a time, and we acclimate. I wonder what would happen if we could resurrect Billy Sunday. I wonder what would happen if we could resurrect D.L. Moody. I wonder what would happen if we could resurrect those men and they could see what has happened to Christianity in America today. You see, gradually the culture has drawn us away from our King Jesus and we've enthroned culture on the throne of our lives. And we've become more influenced by what the world is doing and we've brought those techniques and those methods and those ideas into the, world, into the church and we've baptized them and we say, well, we're just trying to reach more people. God doesn't need our help. He has the Spirit of God. He can do it if we'll just listen to His Word and be obedient. Amen. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Oh, come on now. Do we believe that? I mean, we just need to go to Lifeway and get a 40-day program. We, we just need to write the right curriculum. We just need the right, the, the right program in our church. 12 steps, and we can get it done. He says, the problem, folks, when Jesus is no longer king, then we look for other ways to accomplish what only Jesus can accomplish, and it never turns out good for us. This is directly applicable in many ways to people in our day who call themselves Christians. See, they want the privilege of being God's people, but they don't want the responsibility of surrendering and submitting. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In the companion text in Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? But you see, the Bible says in Colossians 1, 13, that God has delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. What that means is that Jesus is the king of our life. Jesus is the master. He's the boss. He's the one who makes the decisions for us. We don't get to make those decisions. And he's already told us his decisions right here in his word. We need to be careful as we exegete this text. Lest while pointing fingers at these ancient Israelites and accusing them of not wanting to submit to the authority of God in their lives, that we become guilty of the very same thing only to a greater degree in light of all that's happened at Calvary. There's a fourth thing I want you to see. And this is a wonderful thing in this text. It's the grace of God. I mean, even in their rebellion, even though they don't want God as their king anymore, even though they don't want to hear what God has to say, even though they don't go to God and say, God, what do you want? They tell God what, they, what he ought to give them. God is still acting in grace. There are many who say, well, in the Old Testament, it was under the law. That was the dispensation of law, and now we're under the dispensation of grace. There's a problem with that. It's wrong. God's always worked in grace. In Genesis, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God has always been a God of grace. Since the Garden of Eden forward, God has always been a God, a God of grace. God could have punished Adam and Eve by taking their lives, but instead he made clothes for them and he provided for them. God is a God of grace. Grace. 
And I want you to see the grace of God in this text. First of all, we see his grace in his faithfulness to his people in spite of their faithlessness. God is faithful when we are not. I don't know about you folks, but that's a good word for me this morning. And if you don't think you've not been faithful to God, if you think you've always been faithful to God, you're mistaken. We're all faithless from time to time. We all sin. We don't believe in sinless perfection, do we? We all sin. And when we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the midst of Israel's faithlessness, God is still faithful to them. We see God's faithfulness to faithless people. Secondly, we see God's grace in the fact that he warned them about the consequences of their sin. <laughs> Just think about it. If you have somebody that is running in rebellion against you, the only reason you're going to tell them a word of warning, the only reason you're going to warn them about the consequences of their sin is because you love them. If you have a mortal enemy and they're about to do something really dumb, you're like, well, I hope that works out for you. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. But if it's your child, if it's your spouse, if it's your brother or your sister, you're going to beg them and plead with them. You're going to warn them. This is how God feels. In Ezekiel, the Scripture says, Son of man, I've made you a watchman of the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest them not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked ways, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. You see, we have a, a God who warns us about the consequences of sin, and he's called us to warn others about the consequences of sin. It doesn't matter whether they listen or not. We still have that responsibility. Samuel, it doesn't matter whether they listen to you. Samuel, you still have a responsibility to go and warn them. That's God's grace right there, folks. There's a third thing I see about God's grace here. And that is we see that in his grace, he did not allow their rebellion to thwart his plan. Remember, it's not that they wanted a king, it's the kind of king they wanted and that they wanted him now on their terms, not on God terms, that caused this to be a sin. Instead of going to God and seeking direction, they were going to God with preconceived notions. Instead of waiting for God's timing, they were insisting that they had what they wanted when they wanted it, but God's plan and his grace was going to work out and they would suffer the consequences of their sin under the rule of Saul, but God had a king in mind all along and his name was David. And that's the final thing I want you to see in this text. It's a word about the sovereignty of God and his salvation. It's right here. The gospel's here, folks. While all the kings were going to be flawed and fallen, it was through King David's lineage that the one who was flawless and would never fall would come, and he would come through the Davidic line, and his name would be Jesus, the Lion of Judah, born in Bethlehem. He would be the one true righteous king that will reign forever and ever. In John chapter 18, there's a very interesting dialogue between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. Some people say, well, Pontius Pilate never lived. Well, I know that he lived, first of all, because the Bible tells me so. Secondly, because several years ago in Israel, as they were uncovering some archaeological ruins, they came across a stone that had been used as a seat in one of the amphitheaters, and when they flipped it over, it had the name Pontius Pilate on it. Third, I have a coin that has Pontius Pilate's insignia on it that I bought in Israel. I know Pontius Pilate was real. John chapter 18, Jesus and Pontius Pilate are having a discussion. Jesus is about to be condemned to the cross, and the Jews couldn't crucify him on their own. They had to have the Romans' permission, so they go to Pontius Pilate, and they say, we want this man crucified. So Pontius Pilate is interviewing Jesus, and he says, are you a king, the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? 
Your own nation and chief priests delivered you up to me. What have you done? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And of course, Pilate's going to go on and say, what is truth? You see, Jesus himself confesses that he is a king, and while his kingdom has already come, it has not come to fruition in its fulfillment. That is to say, for now he rules and reigns in the hearts and lives of those who have trusted him, but one day, listen to me, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and all the nations around us will bend the knee and bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. Revelation chapter 19. Oh, I love this text. Verse 11 through 16, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself, and he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus reigns, folks. The question is, does he reign in your heart? Does he reign in your life? Are you like the Israelites who want the privilege of being God's people, but not the responsibility of surrendering everything to God? Are you playing this religious game? That's the most easy thing to do. Just play the religious game. We've all grown up in church. We know how to speak the language. We know how to play the game. We know how to fool others into thinking that we are spiritual. But we cannot fool God. The nations around them thought, oh, those are Hebrews. They worship a very unique God, but they couldn't fool God. And neither can you and I. We can't fool God. We have this tendency to want to rule ourselves. That's what sin is, folks. That's the very essence of sin. I want to be in charge of my life. I don't want God in charge of my life. And Jesus came to deliver us from the power of sin so that when we surrender our life to him, he is now the Lord. He is now the boss, the king. John says in chapter 8, you, Jesus, is, he's quoting Jesus. He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin, and the slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son does remain forever. If therefore the son has made you free, you are free indeed. That's the gospel right there. Jesus came to set us free from the penalty of sin. He is in the process of, of setting us free from the power of sin. We have the Spirit of God within us if we're believers. And someday when the trumpet sounds, we'll be set free from the presence of sin. Till then, we have a responsibility to let him rule and reign in our lives, in our homes, in our businesses, in our church. Pray with me. Father, this morning, as we've studied your word, it's our desire, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us individually because you alone know our hearts you alone know what needs to take place in our lives and in our hearts and our spirit no one can know that except you and father i pray that your your holy spirit would bring convicting power in each of our lives to show us those areas lord where we're being drawn away by the culture drawn away being tempted to want to be like the world around us lured by things that are temporal and have no true value 
And Lord, that we would be consecrated and committed and set apart for you and you alone. Father, this morning during this time of response, there may be some who want to come and recommit themselves to you. There may be one here, Lord, one watching online this morning that needs to give their heart and their life to you and surrender themselves to know freedom from sin and have that new life that comes in Jesus alone. My prayer this morning, Lord, is your word would not return void. It would accomplish the purpose for which it's been sent forth. In Jesus' name, stand with me. This is our hymn of response. God is speaking to you this morning. I invite you to come. Maybe there's a decision you need to make. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus, rededicate your life, get some things right between you and God, between you and somebody else. Maybe this morning... God's calling you to be a member of Kirby Woods Baptist Church and to come and be a part of what he wants to do here. Now is your opportunity to respond as we sing.